All right, let's do a quick survey. Uh, I've met some of you, but I know we have a very diverse audience here, so I just want to ask two questions. And before I give the questions, there are going to be four categories of answers, so you've got to memorize a lot here. Okay, so first is very clear. I'll tell you the question in a second, but the answers are going to be very clear, pretty clear, pretty unclear, very unclear. Got that? Very clear, pretty clear, pretty unclear, very unclear. Okay, so first question is, how clear do you feel about what you want to do in your career? So I'm just gonna, gonna count down. So if you feel very clear, raise your hand. All right, and, and don't try to impress me because if you all say very clear for both questions, then there's no reason for me to be here. <laughs> all right, pretty clear. Pretty unclear. Very unclear. Okay, well, you guys are liars, but, and this is an ethics conference. <laughs> so, uh, but, all right, so the second one is, how clear are you on how to get there? And, and by get there, I mean do it in a way that's, that's successful where you can enjoy it, but also where you're financially comfortable, at the very least. So, someone's trigger happy. Uh, very clear. All right, so interesting, so fewer responses there. Uh, pretty clear. Pretty unclear, very unclear. All right, so we got some, some stuff to work with here. So career, I, I find fascinating any issue in life where everyone says they want something and almost nobody has it. Everyone says they want something and almost nobody has it, nobody knows how to do it. So one issue that we're not gonna talk about today but it's worth pondering is education. Everyone says I want Everyone have a great education. I never met one person who said they were anti-education, uh, right? Everyone wants all the kids to have a good education, and yet they never do, and nobody seems to be able to figure it out. So that's, those problems I always find interesting. So we're not, we're not talking about that one, but it's, it's, it's a good kind of thing to think about. The one we're going to talk about today is career. Because if you ask anybody, they'll say, yes, I want a career with two things. One is I'm passionate about it. I really enjoy it. And two is that I have success in it, and that includes financial success, because with financial success, we can not only enjoy our career, but we can enjoy more easily every aspect of life. If you don't have any time, for example, it's hard to enjoy your friends. It's hard to do things like go to the beach. Uh, I say that because I'm from Laguna Beach, so that's a particular bias of mine, but whatever you happen to love to do besides your work, you want to be able to do, and yet it's very rare if you ask adults have you made this work that mostly they'll, if they're being honest, they'll say no. And I remember as a kid growing up and being told, you know, you got to do this and you got to do that. And, and I would, and then I'd say, well, why do I have to do that? And they'd say, well, because that's how you become successful. And then I'd say, well, are you successful? And they'd say, yeah, but it's, you don't really seem to love what you do and or be, be financially successful at it. So why should I want to be like you? Maybe I should do something uh, something different. So there's sort of two categories, I think, of people getting this issue wrong. And you observe this a lot. So one, and I think the most cliche aspect of this, is people who say, who, who kind of make their career work financially, but not passion-wise. So they, they settle, they do what's quote unquote practical. And I went to Duke University, graduated in 2002, and it was shocking to me how many of the students chose one of three career paths, consulting, investment banking, or law school. Consulting, investment banking, or law school. Now, it was very unlikely in my mind that 80% of the students at Duke University just happened to have a deep-seated passion for consulting, investment banking, or law school. I don't know the percentage. But I'd ask everyone, they'd say, well, that's what I'm, I'm gonna do. And I'd say, well, why are you gonna do that? Do you really, I never heard you mention that once as something you were passionate. Uh, I, I might have never mentioned anything besides beer in terms of, and, and basketball, watching basketball in terms of what they're passionate about. But they'd say, well, you know, I need to have a career, right? I need to have a career. And so at, at age 21, 22, they already gave up. They already gave up on doing something that they really enjoy. And I think many of you uh, have read The Fountainhead at the beginning. There's just this great line by Howard Rourke uh, about how 
if, if I'm not doing something I'm passionate about, I'm sentence, sentencing myself to a life uh, of torture. So there's that, that thing, like the, the allegedly practical person who's not passionate, although it's not really practical to make yourself miserable or bored. So it's not really practical, but it's at least financially practical. Now the other side of it is the side that I was more sympathetic to, and I'm gonna talk more to this side today, and that's the side of you're passionate about something, but you can never really make it work. So you're passionate, but you can never really make it work or you're always struggling. And I, I saw this, as I'll talk about in a minute, my career is ideas. And with people in the field of ideas, and particularly with controversial ideas, people who have been influenced a lot by Ayn Rand, uh, I would just see person after person and they couldn't really make it work. It just, they were always struggling and they never really seemed to find a market. And you see this in other fields, you see it in art, you know, different kinds of art, movies, literature, people talk about, I'm really passionate about that, but they can never really seem to, to make it work. And that itself is incredibly, incredibly frustrating because if you're passionate about it, but you can't make it work, you're not fully realizing uh, the passion. So for me, I was definitely on the, the passion side. Like I had from age 20 at least, I, I never occurred to me that I would do something that I didn't really like, like I'd rather go broke, and, and in fact, I did go broke, as I'll talk about in a second. But it was just, you know, you're gonna figure out what you wanna do, and then you're gonna do it. And I had this conviction, I will make it work somehow. Like no matter what it is, whatever it is I wanna do, I'll make it work. And I think that is a good conviction if you actually know how to make it work, which I did not. Uh, but then that's really what I wanna share today, how, how, you can make it, how you can make it work. So when I was about 15, I think what I became passionate about started. I was always a math science kid. And I started, I decided, I'm hearing all these people argue about politics. I'm so tired of them arguing. They never make any sense. They're always just back and forth and it's really annoying. And my parents are in politics, so all their friends are in politics. And they're just jabbering and, not my parents, but you know, they're, they're friends, in case they're watching this video. <laughs> Not anyone in particular, if you're watching this video, but it's like I didn't like things like that. I like things like engineering you can solve it. And I thought, well, you should be able to think logically about these human problems like politics just like anything else. And I started studying different thinkers. And then when I was 18, I read Atlas Shrugged and Ayn Rand. And it's like, holy, this person is on a whole different level. I mean, she's just so clear in how she thinks about things. So I just became obsessed and read everything I could, just tried to understand it. At the time, I had intended to be a businessman in tech, uh, but... I just, by the time I was 20, it just became obvious to everybody, this is what you're obsessed with, you should, you should do this in some way. And so I decided, all right, I'm, I, what I wanna be is a, a practical intellectual or practical philosopher. I, I wanna teach people ideas because I think these ideas matter, that somehow they improve their life. Now, I wasn't totally clear on how, but I just had this conviction that, that it's gonna improve their life. And the first point to make is that I had no idea how to make this work at all. I had the conviction that you could, but I just, I had no idea. And on top of that, I was very insistent on doing it exactly a certain way that was exactly the way you're not supposed to do it. So for example, if you wanna be in philosophy, at the very least, you gotta go to grad school, right? I mean, that ha at least has some sort of professional track, or at least if you wanna do philosophy, people have to know that you have a PhD, right? You have to be Dr. Epstein. And it's like, well, I don't like, I don't like academia. It's not for me. I know I don't want to teach there, so I'm not going to do that. And it's just like, I'll be good. My conviction was always, I'll be good enough where it won't matter. Like nothing will matter if I'm good enough, which is true with a qualification that we'll discuss. Um, and I wanted to write for the general public about philosophy, and you don't see many people uh, doing that, but I just figured that this, there's something there where there's a way to make it uh, work. And, and there was, but it took, I would say, 13 solid years to make that work, and I think a lot of the motivation for anyone who writes or speaks, especially about any kind of personal development, is to try to help people save a lot of the suffering that you went through to figure it out. So that's why I'm giving this, this talk, because uh, I was able to go from having no idea what I was doing to actually having a career where I get to teach people the practical value of philosophy. Now, I do it in particular in energy, and I can talk a little bit about my own uh, work, but I don't think that's super relevant today. But the bottom line is, just to give you an example, 
of, of where it's gone, I now can go to businesses, and it was always a goal of mine to teach businessmen philosophy, and businessmen now pay quite a bit of money to learn philosophy, like which seemed impossible 13 years ago. So I want to go through the process of, of how you can, of how this happened, but, but more importantly, what the principles are for you. So I like dealing in, in concepts. I think these are three really valuable concepts. If you even get one of them and can apply it, I think, I think it'll change your life, honestly. So they're going to be, we'll repeat them a lot, the career Venn diagram, the customer avatar, and solution selling sequence. So career Venn diagram, customer avatar, and solution selling sequence. And instead of doing questions at the end, after each concept, I wanna take questions. So, so think of your questions actively, because each of these has to be applied, and feel free to bring up your own example. Now, because we're short on time, please don't ask a non-question question where you give a speech and stuff, but definitely, definitely engage. You know, this is your opportunity. I'll be here at lunch, I'm happy to talk to people, I'm here all day, but might as well take advantage of the opportunity now. So let's talk about career Venn diagram. We all know Venn diagrams from math. I found this a very powerful way to think of things, and this goes to the, the, the people who just have the passion but can't make it work, or the people who can make it work but don't have the passion. Every sale, every productive activity, every trade, which is about what this, confer this, is what this conference is about, involves two things, I think. Every career, of course. There are problems that you want to solve, and I mean problems in the very broadest sense. So this can be an aspiration that you want to fulfill, something that you want to create, but there's something that, that is needed, and you can create something to make it better. So there's, that's what you're passionate about. So in my case, I was really, really passionate about, among other things, using philosophy to make issues really, really clear. So if people are confused about energy and I have philosophy as my toolkit, I can help them think about it in a way that'll allow them to make much better decisions. So whatever you are passionate about or might be passionate about, you can think of it in terms of what kinds of problems do I like to solve? And one aspect of that is how do I, how do I like to use my mind? And this is not really gonna be the focus today, but I think it's, it's important to, to have this as part of the picture. Uh, and just to give you like a bonus concept that I think is useful, if, you, if you're thinking about this, if you find it difficult to think about, there's one question that I've, I've started giving to people lately that, that people find helpful. And it's kind of a weird question, but because it's, it's not exactly philosophically correct, but it's, it's a helpful lead in. And so the question is, when in my whole life when I'm working, do I feel like I was doing what I was born to do? So in my whole life when I'm working, when do I feel like I'm doing what I was born to do? And I find that, that you'll, if, you, if you start introspecting for that when you're doing different activities, you'll see, and you'll find it in unexpected places, but you'll see, I feel totally in the zone. Like I feel, I feel totally myself right now at this moment in time. And if you can identify that, that's a very precious thing to identify. So for instance, for me, uh, I, for me, it's really actually sitting down in front of a computer, either writing or trying to solve some strategy problem. I do tons and tons of speaking and I enjoy speaking and I enjoy, but, but speaking, I, it's rarely 100% that for me. The thing that's that is when often when I come home from speaking, I've been speaking on the road for two weeks and there's some writing assignment or some problem that's been in the back of my mind for three weeks and I haven't gotten time and I just sit down and work on it. It's like, it, it's just, everything is right in the world. So if you know that feeling, it's super, super uh, helpful. So whatever, for whatever that's worth. Uh, so, but today we're gonna focus on the problems that others want solved, because I think this is, this is part of, of making it, it work. And this, this is, in a sense, the harder thing to do because it requires thinking as somebody else. It's easier to think of ourselves. I mean, for, for understandable reasons, we are ourselves. But think about what I want, what kinds of problems do I want solved? But to think about it from another person's perspective and to think of it very, very deeply, and deeply is gonna be the key, that's a totally different, that is a totally different skill set. but it will change your life if you know how to do it. So the, we're gonna talk about, it. if you can think of somebody else's problems and challenges with the same depth and precision an emotional connection as you can think of your own, then you will be completely changed as a productive person because you always have to trade, so you need to see it from their perspective. 
Is Greg Salmieri in the room by any chance? So Greg will laugh at this, I think, because we've talked about this. So I just want to show you, this was my first attempt when I was 23 years old at coming up with a business where I could teach people uh, philosophy. So this is a little distorted because it's from the Wayback Machine, which traces back your old web page. But the idea was I would be an intellectual bodyguard for businesses. And the basic premise was if you look at, and this is true, by the way, if you look at, I'll take fossil fuels, although I didn't know that issue at all back then. If you look at, say, the fossil fuel industry, they're under attack. Now, some of you don't know my views or, or might disagree with my views, so, but just assume for this moment that I'm right, because just so you understand the example, that fossil fuel, the fossil fuel industry is a fundamentally good industry. That they are under attack by certain ideas. And I'd say at the core, they're, the, they're attack, uh, under attack based on the idea that we, that we should be green, which is that our goal in life should not be focusing on maximizing human well-being, it should be minimizing our impact on the planet. And that whole focus makes us, for example, with something like CO2 in the atmosphere, expect that it will be a disaster, even if it's just a mild impact, and ignore all the positive benefits. So right now we're in a culture where people talk about restricting 80% of fossil fuel use, which is, that's 87% of the world's energy use, in the name of CO2. And in my book I analyze, if you look at this, this is absolutely catastrophic for human life. We should actually be using more because the benefits far away the costs. But because people think of the ideal is not really about human well-being, but about not impacting nature, they don't think that way. So, that in itself will not be fully convincing if, if you're not familiar with the argument. But in any case, the, the only point you need to understand here is that this is what I believed. And I believed this, and I thought, well, businesses should line up to my door, right? They should, I, I know how important ideas are. They need better ideas. Their communications are terrible. They're always appeasing their opponents. I mean, I could criticize them forever and ever, which was kind of a sign that I didn't really understand the problem. And can anyone guess how many not how many customers I got, but how many inquiries I got. Zero. So I got zero. So it's 23 years old, supporting myself, not independently wealthy. Whatever stocks I had had, I think I had probably sold to, to finance this little stage of my life. So, you know, going broke. So you start to, makes you start to think about this, you know, if, if you're starting to suffer that kind of pain. Like, why can't, why can't I make it work? Now, the key to the, the important thing is this was actually a really good idea. And it was completely legitimate for me to want to teach philosophy to businesses. But I had absolutely no real understanding of the problems that they wanted to solve. And here's the key as they experienced them. So I had a sense that, oh, they have to deal with attackers and they somehow need ideas. But I had no idea what problems they actually encounter, what problems a CEO encounters day to day, how he's thinking about those problems, and therefore how I can connect with him and I can have this Venn diagram intersection between his problems, the problems he wants solved, and the problems I want to solve. I just had no clue. I didn't think of the person at all. All I thought about was what I want to do. But that's invalid, because if we're making a trade, I need to be able to explain to him how what he wants to do is compatible with how I want to help him. I'm actually helping him. I can't just say, well, I, you know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to just throw out some philosophy and then you just pay me some money if you don't see any value in it. So this goes to the idea of the customer avatar. This is one of the things I was really uh, uh, lacking. But before we get to that, anyone have any questions about the career Venn diagram? You can at least nod, nod awkwardly if it made sense to you. Oh. <laughs> Elizabeth. Oh, false alarm. Okay. Do people generally get that idea of career Venn diagram? Okay, so now we're going to go with their problems, and the way to understand their problems largely is helped by this idea of customer avatar. Now, there's no exact formula for this. The basic concept is you want a detailed profile of the person you want to help, and it's so detailed that you can feel what it's like to be them. And I, I like these feel tests where you just know, so in the same way, it's what you feel like it's what you were born to do, even though that's really, I mean, nobody really, you don't really have an inherent purpose that way. But you can feel like it so you know, oh, this is like, 
I, I get it. I, I get what they're going through. So I think often parents with young children, they're with them so many steps of the way that they can, they can really empathize with their feelings well. And also they care about them so much that they're very dedicated to it. But with somebody you're thinking of doing a trade with, so it doesn't matter. You want them to buy your art. You want them to hire you. Uh, whatever it is, you, if the more you understand about them and their problems and how they experience them, the more you can help solve them. So you look at these, these questions, by the way, uh, this is a good time to point out, everyone should have a handout. Now this handout is one that I usually give for talks that I give about energy, so it has a bunch of irrelevant stuff about energy on it. All that I need you to do, if you want, is just put your email address on it. So this will allow me to do two things. One is I can send you some resources on this topic, and at the end, uh, I'll tell you why I wanna send you uh, just a sample chapter of my book in the email, because uh, I think it's really important, and this is the project I'm passionate about uh, myself. So hopefully you'll sign up for that, or if you find that paper is antiquated, or if at some stu as, if, as with some students at a college I recently spoke to, you somehow think it's wrong to use paper, you can email me at alex at alexepstein.com. This is after a talk, so I felt very disappointed that I hadn't communicated why it's a good idea to use paper. <laughs> I, I should have added a postscript called the moral case for paper. <laughs> but, uh, okay, so you can email alex at alexepstein.com, just put strive uh, in the subject, or you can put that there and we'll pick them up. Also, if you want, you can have one of, if you fill that out, you can have one of these handy, I love fossil fuels pins. All right, so this is the, this is the thing of the customer avatar. So these are some examples. If you look up customer avatar on the internet, it's not a term that I came up with. I believe a, a, a very good marketer named Eben Pagan came up with it. Uh, you can find these kinds of questions. Now, we have to then circle back. So once we have our customer avatar, we have to circle back and ask a key question with our Venn diagram, which is, is there actually an intersection between the problems I want to solve and the problems they want solved? Because there isn't always, and in any transaction, you have to be open to no deal, right? There's no, there isn't actually a compatible thing. And people who are really good at sales and, and who are really pleasant to deal with in sales, they're all, all they're looking for is, is there actually a fit here? They're not looking for, oh, you should buy it. They're just, we're just discovering, does this make sense? And that, you know, that's a much better way to handle it, I think. So you have to circle back and then say, so with my concept, if it had turned out, I actually don't know how to help the businesses do this, I would have to find another business model. So you always have to be open to that, but often your initial passion and your initial desire will be valid. You'll, it will be based on a real insight that there's something in the world that you can improve. There's something valuable you can create, but without understanding the customer and how they think about it, you won't be able to do that. So any questions about customer avatar? Yes. Well, so, so the question is, what are the biggest mistakes people make when they're trying to identify their customers? Uh, erring on, you need to, the, the positive thing is you need to err on the side of knowing them too well. It is almost important, almost impossible uh, to know them too well. It, it really is impossible. Now you can end up wasting time and after time, after a certain amount of time you can refine your process. But at the beginning, I mean everything, like. Just, and you know, kids, birthday, what they do for hobbies. And I'd say a mistake, a methodological mistake in reaching this is not talking to real people. This is a general mistake that people make. They don't like talking to real people, but the easiest way, if you wanna get a sense of people, is actually talk to them. So quick example for me, when I really, uh, one of my goals in the field of energy was to be what you can call a thought leader. So to influence people in the culture, but also influence the, the, the other thought leaders in the field. And one way I came up with getting to know them and getting to see what they would respond to is I came up with a podcast called Power Hour, which, which still exists and I can mail people a link to it. Started it in 2011 and I was completely obscure then. And very quickly what happened is I got to know almost everyone in the field or everyone I liked in the field. And I could have never gotten that from just imagining it in my head. So you have to actually survey people. You have to get their own words. So if it's not in person, do it over the phone. If not on the phone, do survey monkey. But you have to just survey the heck out of them. If you find that you're doing market research and it's just at your computer in your head, unless you have an insane amount of experience to draw from, you're, you're doing it incorrectly. That's a, that's a great question. Any, any more about the customer avatar? Yes. Yes. 
does it change? Oh, so she's asking if, if the customer avatar, thanks Keith, I, I'm still not good at the, the repeating the question after all these years of speaking. The, uh, yeah, so does, does it change over time? Well, the thing that it changes over that's very important is it changes over audience. So in almost any career, you're gonna be dealing with many, many audiences. So take, uh, in, in any given week, what I'll have, so even I'll take right now what I'm doing this week. So I'm speaking at this, which is an audience of people at least with an interest in Ayn Rand's uh, ideas, you know, which is an audience I rarely speak to these days, but it's re really fun for me. Then on Monday, I'm speaking at the American Petroleum Institute, which is the, the biggest energy organization in the world. And then uh, the Monday after that, I'm speaking at Harvard Law School debating some uh, environmentalist about fossil fuels. Uh, and that's to the Federalist Society, but to the broader student body. So those are three radically different audiences. And the more I know about each, uh, the better. Some, a uh, 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 couple of young women here were at Wellesley College where I spoke recently, and it's, it's a similar thing where when I'm there, I need to know exactly what's going on in, in so far as is possible. But at the very least, if you're in ideas, it's different in other fields, in any field really, you have to know what ideas and arguments have they been exposed to. So if, you're, if you're putting a product on the market, the very least you have to know what are the alternatives out there, how do people think about them? Because if I go there saying, hey, here's my view of fossil fuels, the end, it's, whoa, well, they've heard this completely different view and I didn't uh, engage it. But you should have many different avatars for many different audiences. Okay, uh, another great question. So let's go to the final one, which I think puts this all together. So this is a bit of a mouthful. Solution selling sequence. Solution selling sequence. And, and by the way, when you give me your email, I'll send out the slides to everyone. I know everyone's taking pictures and stuff, but I, I promise I will send you the slides because uh, there's a lot of text here. But these are the four steps. So based on the concepts we've discussed, so once you, once you know what you, problems you like to solve, once you know the problems that they want to solve, so you need those, but now you're actually trying to persuade somebody. You're trying to get them to see, oh, I want your solution and I want to pay well for it. And, you know, people start out skeptical for many reasons, in, in part because they, they've gotten burned a lot. Any of you ever seen any of the Peanuts comics, by the way? I, I'm just curious how, what generation I'm in. I think they're coming out with a movie. Has anyone ever seen the thing where Lucy holds the football for Charlie Brown? So it's this, this thing where basically this girl, Lucy, holds the football, tells Charlie Brown, hey, come kick it. And every time he comes, to kick it, she lifts up the football, and then he falls. And she gets him to do this, you know, hundreds of times. So most customers feel like that, right? Like somebody promises them something really enticing, and oh, I've got a solution to your problems, and then basically the football gets pulled up and it doesn't work. So people are, are, are suspicious, and that's one thing that I learned definitely dealing with industry. Uh, they were all certainly suspicious of someone from philosophy with these controversial ideas coming to tell them how to do their job. So first step, this is really key, and this can only come from the avatar. You have to start with the symptoms, and this can be positive or negative. It can be a desire, or it can be a pain, but you have to identify the problem or desire as they experience it. So I'll give you an, a medical example that I recently went through. I, I tore my ligament uh, in my finger. It's fortunately uh, healed because I followed the doctor's advice, which he, he sold me on, even though I didn't want to do it. So I, I had my finger hurt, I hurt it during Brazilian Jiu Jitsu. It was kind of twisted a little bit. Um, I hoped it wasn't a big deal. So I come in, I've got this symptom of my fingers a little bit mangled, you know. I hope that it's not a permanent thing. I hope I don't have to have surgery or something like that. Okay, so that's the number one thing. Now number two is, once you've identified the surface problem, you need to identify the, the root cause of the problem. And this is where all the money and action and, and power is, if you can do it. If, if you really have a, a new way of doing things, that usually means you have a new understanding of a problem that people didn't have before. So let's say with Ayn Rand and philosophy, I didn't have an idea that, hey, you know, Alex, the reason you're confused about all these things in politics and all these things is because you've never thought about your fundamental ideas in life. And therefore, when you're thinking about these things, you're using all these clashing ideas that don't go together at all, and of course you're gonna be confused. But if you realize that, well, a lack of philosophy is the problem, then it'll, it'll, you can make sense of it eventually. So it went from, you know, at first, all I cared about was being confused, but then philosophy, then it's like, oh, what I want now, it's I don't wanna not be confused, right? It's I want a better philosophy. 
but you start there by identifying the problem. So what the doctor did to me is he said, look, here's what happens. You know, there's a difference between a joint and a ligament. Basically, the ligament, and you know, I didn't know anything. The ligament is what holds it straight. I hope I'm getting this right. And basically what you did is that tore, and that's why your pinky is mangled this way. And if you don't fix it, then you're gonna get arthritis and be very unhappy. So even though you wanna go do jujitsu and go to the beach, uh, you shouldn't, you need to do something about it. It's like, okay, now my, my experience changed from my hand is messed up to I need a way to fix a torn ligament. So this can be done on any level of sophistication. You'll see it with any process. So we've got that. Can we get the, um, the thing back up? So then the next thing is identify the root solution of your problem. Of, uh, of the problem. This goes to your understanding and desire to uh, solve a certain problem. If that's really real, then you can say, wow, I have a new way of doing this. So in this case, it was simple, but it was, hey, look, I got this little thing. It's called a splint, and I, but it's a, I have this custom splint that it'll cushion you exactly the right way so that your finger in three weeks, if you followed my advice and don't do all the things you want to do, your finger will be perfectly straight, you know, which, which it is. You did a really good job. So I, but I didn't want to do it, but he explained to me the problem very clearly and he gave me the solution. So I'm like, yes, I will give you my money and I will give you whatever you want me to do. And then what happens afterward? And he said, and then after that, you know, you have a better chance of having your finger work for the rest of your life instead of having arthritis once you turn 40. So like, okay, great. So, but he went through this process of the symptoms, the cause, the root solution, and the results. So if you, you think of it this way, it's like you start out on the surface, you go deep on the problem, then you give the deep solution, then you give the results that they experience. Now, can anyone think of any other examples of, so I just gave the example of the dark, can anyone think of any other examples of where you see this, this methodology? Someone starts out with the surface problem, they see the deep, deeper problem, they see the deeper solution, and then they see the, the results that they'll experience. Yes? Yes, one thing he likens this to. Uh-huh. A little bit. Lean startup methodology he's talking about. But how about, how about a particular thing you've been sold on? Elizabeth. That's great. And so she was talking, I, I can't do justice to that uh, by, by recapping it, but, but it's basically the way that we've, the way that a lot of us, I think, encounter philosophy or, or any, the way, if you think about more broadly, people encounter self-help. They have an experience of this is certain difficulties and then somebody says, rightly or not, like, here's the real problem. But they don't, if you go from here's your surface experience to here's the solution, it doesn't make any sense. It, and it does, they can't really relate to it. Whereas if you can go to the problem, it's, it's very, very, very uh, effective. So it's, it's effective, that's I think the learning process that people go through. So it's, it's the selling process, but it's not artificial. It has to do with the very nature of learning. Let's see where we are on time. Uh, okay, so any, any questions about that process? And if we could put it up one more time, that would be great. So this is, and so selling in the broadest sense, so you're persuading, uh, you're persuading somebody else about pretty much anything, or you're in a job interview. Uh, by the way, I should put in a, a plug for this. If you're interested in just uh, general knowledge about really how to get the context of, of employers, 
Uh, Nicole St. Pierre is here. She's teaching a, a little later today. And she's taught me a lot about this in terms of how to deal with employers. I am, anyone who's worked with me can know, I am no master at knowing how to deal with employers. Uh, I know much more how to deal with, with customers, but the same basic principles uh, are involved. So, yes. Well, but that's a really good point. So the question is, how do you do this given that selling is seen in a negative light? But you don't, you're not always calling it selling. You're really just solving, right? You're, you're actually, you're just helping somebody out with some distinctive knowledge or ability or product that you happen to have that they don't see. And you have to recognize very legitimately, they at the beginning do not have the relevant knowledge to make the right decision to improve their lives. So. I can just use the one that I use myself with ideas in business today. So if I'm, if I'm talking to a group of energy companies, what I'll tell them is I'll start off with the surface problem. So with there, it'll be, if, if you talk to anyone who does government relations in an energy company, they will have two, there are two things that describe them. They are overwhelmed by attacks and they are constantly reactive. So as soon as I say those two words, I never met one person in the industry who did not relate to that. So see, I'm, I'm starting off with the, the surface thing, right? And they totally relate to that. And so first of all, once you relate to them, what's gonna happen, they think, they start to perk up, oh wow, this person really knows what I'm going through, he relates to me, as against if I said, you know what, you know, your real problem is you don't have the right philosophy, they just tune it out. It, that's, that, that seems to be my agenda. Right? It's not relevant to them. So it's all about a learning process. But then I go beneath that and I say, hey, you know what? If you look at the last 25 attacks that you've experienced, let's just ask one question. Are those 25 distinctive attacks or is there anything underlying that they have in common? Because if there's something underlying, then we might be able to do something about it. Otherwise, we're just fending off. And I'll ask, have you ever heard of, have you guys heard of the Hydra before in ancient Greece, the monster? So what happens? It's this multi-headed monster. What happens when you cut off one head of the hydra? Two grow back, right? So they'll say the same thing, two grow back. And I'll say, well, it's really good in life if we, can, if we discover that, these, that lots of things hitting us at the same time are a hydra, then we can find a root cause, then we could do something about it. Wouldn't that be good? Yeah, of course, they'll say yes. And, and you can see full speeches online where I do this. And then I'll say, well, if you observe each one of these attacks, they have something in common which is that no matter what the specific attack, every single one is based on the idea and the argument that we need to get off fossil fuels and switch to green energy, whether it's Keystone, whether it's oil exports, whatever it is, it's all based on the same idea. So notice, I took the surface problem and, and then I put it down to the fundamental, which is there's this hydra, but the hydra is based on an idea. So before 10 minutes ago, or however many minutes ago, this person had no interest in ideas. Ideas seemed irrelevant. Now ideas are the whole solution to their problem. And then I'll elaborate a little bit and say, look, so you, what's going on is there is a moral case against fossil fuels. That's your problem, right? That's the torn ligament, right? So that's what we need to solve. Now, in the way I framed that, what is the next logical thought? If my problem is a moral case against fossil fuels, what might I need? But so what, but this is all like, I'm, I'm explaining it from a, from a selling methodology, but this is completely true, what everything I'm saying, just a matter of sequencing it right. But you think that, so, so then it's, so then I go to, then I can elaborate on the solution, but if you define the problem well enough, that's most of the work because then they, then they will trust you to have the solution because you already are the one knowledgeable about the problem. And, and a lot of the solution will be embedded in the nature of the problem. So if they get, okay, it's a problem of ideas, we need different ideas, then I can say, well, the, the particular form of the solution are these three things. Like you need to implement these ideas in a, a nationwide campaign and invest in that and stop, stop all of your, um, you know, what they do is they, they basically just endorse the idea that we need to get off fossil fuels, but they say, let's do it in 30 years instead of five. And you explain, well, this doesn't work at all for logical reasons. So you need this campaign, you need an educational campaign, whatever the solution is, but the core of it was explaining and getting uh, beneath the problem. Does that, does that make sense? And then you can see the results. So then you can see, so you start out kind of with the nightmare. At the end, the results are the dream. 
you can, you can see, oh, well, if we did this, wow, my employees would be more motivated because they'd actually believe what they did was good and we'd be helping all kinds of people because more people could have our product, particularly the poorer the people, the more they'll benefit because the more they're hurt by more expensive energy, et cetera, et cetera. You can paint that and it's real, but imagine you skipped a step. So you just started out by saying, you know what? If you pay me, I'll make all these problems go away and your life will be amazing, right? Then you're a huckster, right? Or if you even said, if you pay me, I'll give you a moral case for fossil fuels and this campaign and this thing, and then all your problems, it doesn't make any sense, right? But when you do, every, or if I just started out with just the problem, but not the surface connection, so every step is logically necessary to, for them to understand. It's a process of understanding. It's, it's selling is derivative. Selling is the concept, but it, it, selling is the consequence. So um, let me just go to sort of what this has resulted in for me. So it's, and I, I just want to give this as an illustration of, of you know, how far it's possible to come. I, I'm not going to have one of these Tony Robbins, like, now I have eight yachts and this kind of thing. <laughs> but but it, it, what I've been able to do, which is what I wanted to do, was be able to really talk about stuff and write about stuff that I'm passionate about and think about it and, and I think help really affect change in the world with it and, and be financially successful enough with it where I can do pretty much anything else I want. Uh, with my time. And so that took a long time. So hopefully these methodologies will help you and save you time in doing the same thing. But just to give you sort of one sense, if I look now for, for speaking, just to give you a sense of even in, even in 2011 when I started my own organization, Center for Industrial Progress, I had some idea that, well, you can make a certain amount of money speaking, people value speaking. And, and at the time, I charged a uh, thousand bucks a speech, and, except that nobody would pay it. So, and people are like, you're crazy. Nobody should pay you $1,000. So I remember I negotiated my first deal and I was very grateful to the people because the only one I could get. I negotiated my first deal for five speeches for 4,000 bucks. So 800 bucks a speech, including a debate with Greenpeace where I you know, prepared a lot and stuff. And it was just, but the reason was because I hadn't really found a value proposition where what I could do really intersected with what other people wanted. And by getting a lot better at what I did, simultaneous with integrating it with what was actually valuable to other people, I got to the point where every at group of people that I dealt with were more interested because I was delivering more value. So I got a lot uh, more impact with students. I started getting recognized in the field. And then uh, I got recognized in the industry. And then, so if you just look at my speaking page now, it's sort of crazy because like they'll talk about, you know, New York Times bestselling author and, and like they charge, you know, 20 grand to have me speak. This is my speaking agency. And it was just, this was completely unimaginable. But in a sense, it makes total sense because if you have something that you're really good at and really passionate about that you believe in, you're probably really good at it ultimately. If you're not, that's a whole other discussion which we can have. But if you are and you're passionate about it, and then you also understand completely the person that you want to help with it, you will be so different from everyone else because almost nobody does that. Almost nobody really cares enough about what they do to do it well and cares enough about the customer and helping them to do it well. So you just will, everyone else will seem to be moving in slow motion. Let me just make sure. All right, so we're, um, I'll take a question or two in a minute, but if you just want to get validation from someone a lot more successful than I am, I remember an anecdote in the, the Walter Isaacson biography of Steve Jobs, which, by the way, I do not consider a good biography. I think you should watch his interviews on YouTube, which are unbelievable if you want to understand Jobs. But there was a story in it where the author, Isaacson, seemed to disapprove of Jobs, where I thought this captured the essence of how he epitomized what I'm talking about today. So there was, and, and what was happening was he was talking about a menu and someone made a computer menu uh, in a way that he didn't like or he didn't think it was perfect. And Isaacson in effect is rolling his eyes with the way that he's writing about the situation. And the guy says, look, Steve, it's just a menu. And Jobs just absolutely blows his top. This is just a menu. Do you know how many blank, blank, blank times somebody is gonna look at this in their lives? And you think about that, it's, it's this intersection of he believes so strongly in creating these life enhancing products and he's thinking so carefully about every little bit of the customer experience. So imagine that you did that 
yourself, you had those mindsets yourself, you would stand out so much and no one would have any idea why. It would just seem like, well, why did X? Why did you rock it to the top of the field in so few years? But it's because you got those two things right. So hopefully that's helpful if we just, just to review the concepts. So there's the career Venn diagram, there's the customer avatar, there's a solution selling sequence. Uh, again, hopefully share your information so you can get this and more, and also so that you can stay in touch. I'm, I'm, I, I respond to email uh, and most of the time. And it's, you know, but, but I, for people in this audience in particular, I wanna help you because for me, it's, it's, you know, Ayn Rand is so meaningful in my life. And so anyone who's interested in her and, and wants to use her ideas in a practical, beneficial way, uh, I'll, you know, I'm happy to be here and, and I'm happy to help you in whatever way I can. So thank you very much. Are we out of time? Five minutes for questions. Uh, I'll get you, Elizabeth, if there's nobody else, but, uh, well, you also know me, I'm easier to reach. Yes? When you say you're more skeptical when people are trying to sell you something, do you think there's another <laughs> Am I more skeptical when people try to sell me something? I, it, it's, it's funny, because I'm like this with everything that I know. I am very analytical about it. Like, I'm just watching their process. So when I watch a speaker, I can't help but watch the mechanics of what the speaker is doing, what they're doing well that I can learn from, what they're not doing well that I can learn from. So if you're ever speaking and I'm in an audience, do not look at me because I will have a very weird face when I'm <laughs> responding. But, but so I'm always noticing and the, the mark of someone who is truly great is that they will make me forget no matter what, or they'll do it. I'll know exactly what they're doing. I'll be thousand bucks, whatever you want. I will, no, it happens all the time. I mean, I, and it's also like I can sort of short circuit it. So if I know they have a value, it's just like, all right, I know what you're going to tell me. You're right about it. I, I get it. I'll just give you the money and let's save ourselves some time or vice versa. You should really get better uh, at this. But yeah, it's, it totally changes, totally changes the experience. And, and, but every piece of ad copy I read, every, I mean, I never thought I would be really passionate about marketing, but but it's really about understanding very deeply your market. When in 2004, I had a, a really interesting discussion with uh, my jiu-jitsu instructor then, a guy named Lloyd Irvin, who was this, it was and is this amazing marketer. And I, he would send out these emails. He had a list of something like 100,000 people. It's probably hundreds of thousands now. And I had a list of 200 people. And I was critiquing him on his grammar. And I'm like, did you know you made this grammatical error and this typo? And he said, well, Alex, you know, thanks a lot for pointing that out. I'll always correct these things. But you should probably understand the principles that are allowing me to reach 100,000 plus people. So it took me about eight years to get that into my head, but it was, a very, it was very valuable. So one thing I'll send out is just a couple of recommendations of, of marketing books, because marketing books are really about understanding the psychology and values of other people rather than just here's how to use Twitter. That's, that's derivative. The medium is always derivative to understanding the market and having the right message. I think there are, yes. Okay, well, oh, there it is, hi. Um, so when it comes to a lot of problems that a lot of people care about, problems especially that deal with, um, deal kind of more intimately with having roots in philosophy, it seems like the part of that sequence in identifying the root um, might be easy for somebody who is interested in philosophy and understands the connection to business, but convincing a customer of that seems something that would be a challenge and that uh, before, before you have results that speak for themselves, um, for certain problems like political problems or problems regarding business and business environment and those kinds of things, it seems like it's difficult to convince your customer that you have the right route problem and therefore that you're selling them the right method of solving their problem because they've never heard of that root problem or there's all of these other things in culture or other philosophies or other people trying to get their attention who tell them that the root is not what you're saying. Oh, so yeah. Especially with your business, um, what's your experience with that? Well, uh, so the, I'd separate two things. One is, is it difficult for you to do and is it, or is it inherently difficult to do? Because it's no longer difficult for me to do, but it, it used to be difficult. But I think I could teach somebody, like, I, if you give me anyone's field now, 
I think in five minutes I could come up with a decent way of doing the sequence because I understand, because we have to understand is exactly the precise way in which the philosophy is impacting it. It's not, because you don't just say, oh, it's objectivism or even humanism or something that broad. So in, in what I gave you, what I gave you works pretty well. So I, I gave the example of well, we've got the hydra. And so what am I doing even there? I'm looking for a philosophical fundamental. I'm not saying that, but I'm just, I'm naming the point about fundamentals. And then the thing I'm focusing on is the I ideal or the standard of value. So if I say, you know what, the argument is always some form of we need to get off fossil fuels and go to green energy, then on a certain level, I've named a standard of value, and I, I'll call it that. And what I found, in the last year, I've spoken dozens and dozens of times about my book, or the content of my book, and what I found fascinating is what people respond to and what they don't. Number one thing they respond to without question is the philosophy and the points about standard of value, and more broadly, the points about methodology. Because if you can show somebody a, a way of thinking about something that illuminates, it's, it, it blows their minds. So it's just that you have to be really clear yourself on how it can help them, and, and you need to be able to explain it really well. And I'd say five years ago, for instance, I didn't even know their problems. I didn't even know about the Hydra, really. I just knew Alex hates everything I see on TV. I hate all the commercials. I hate the way they're always appeasing their attackers. But I didn't really know, what is the life of a government relations person at an oil company like? And so if I don't know his exact problems, how am I going to know the solution? In the same way as if, I'd imagine for a psychologist, if you know, they, they know a whole bunch of fundamentals that could be involved, and maybe there are some universal ones, but to help the person, they'd actually need to talk to them a lot and learn about their specific situation. So if anyone wants to email me or, or talk to me and ask about their specific field, uh, it's good. That, that would be good. In my view, it is completely necessary to be done with Ayn Rand's ideas, but it's been done in almost none of the fields. So my own goals are to do it in a lot of the other industry, heavy industry fields like GMO, gen you know, all kinds of genetic engineering, all the ones that are attacked by the green movement. But I think it is possible to do it with things like healthcare and spending and, uh, and also to the businessmen in that, in that field. It's just a, it's, it's a lot of work. And if, if you sort of wanted to know the fundamental like bonus idea behind all of this that allowed me to come up with all of this over time is that really I think all of success is just a combination of intellectual honesty and persistence. Because so the intellectual honesty is at every stage you are honest with yourself about where you are in relation to where you want to be. Any kind of delusion in that, you're done. Right? So, and that's really hard because sometimes we're not happy. You know, being having a bunch of credit card debt when you imagined yourself at the top of the philosophical hill, that's not thrilling. But it, you know, reality is what it is. So if somebody is totally honest, and, and that extends to every aspect of my career that needs to be a certain way, how good am I at speaking, how good am I at writing, how do I present myself, whatever it is, if you're honest about that and you're persistent, then you will automat over time, you'll just find ways to close the gap between where you are and where you want to be. So with this kind of thing, if you come out of this and you know, okay, it's possible to truly make philosophy real to somebody as a solution to their problem, but I have no idea how to do it. If you care enough and you keep being honest, every step you make forward, you'll acknowledge. And if you're persistent, you'll do it. But the, the persistence is hard. It's easy, it's easy to give up. Uh, and that's part of why you want to think about what do you really like to do enough where you can't give it up because it would be against your nature. Uh, all right, you. time's up.